three, two, one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Nine Finger Chronicles. And today I am joined by the one and only Skip Sly. Skip, what do you know, man? Thanks for having me. Just uh, yeah. another another swamped week at the farm and being at the Classic all three days is not something I normally do, but I went to those three days and then I had to help a buddy for two days. So now I'm like looking at my list today on all the stuff I have to catch up on. It's mind boggling busy, but oh, I mean, good yeah. busy, but yeah. good job. Yeah. Five days out of uh, the loop, just the list gets crazy. Yeah. So I'm looking at the wall of all these giant bucks behind you. I know you're a whitetail nut. I know you you love doing everything under the sun when it comes to whitetails, but it's springtime. Do you get jacked yeah. up about turkeys at all? No, I no? get jacked okay. up about whitetails. I'm whitetails right now. <laughs> like this is go time. This is when you make the difference. This yeah. is when I go hard on whitetails. Everybody's like, I go hard in November. No, this is when I go hard and I love it. I mean, when I, before, this podcast and after I leave, I'll be do I'll be working on the farm, whether it's farm related or deer hunting related, you know. Yeah. So no, this is full time. This is full time whitetails. And when guys are turkey hunting on my farm, usually they'll ask me for permission, and then they're like walking by me or driving by me while I'm doing chores so they can go play turkey hunting. Yeah. And yeah, I don't have time for it. I, okay. But with my son, I will go. Um, yeah, but I don't know how to do it really. Yeah, yeah, that's the same with me. Like I go, I go turkey hunting because I can't go whitetail hunting right now, and so now that my daughter is old enough, you know, like I, I think after I get done recording today, I'm going to go buy a 410 uh, so she can shoot something. She's not. I think she can handle a 20 gauge, but I think a 410 is going to be a little bit more her style. And so I'm going to go, I'm going to go check out one of those, but she loves turkey hunting. And because she loves turkey hunting, then I love turkey hunting. And basically it's just to hang out with her and my son. So. Same with me. And yeah. like when I went turkey hunt with my son last year, I called a buddy of mine and I just said, what, what do I need? Like a hardcore turkey guy. And we went and sat in one of my deer blinds. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, I know they'll come by here. So we almost hunted them like deer, yeah. not efficient, not great. My yeah. turkey hunting uh, skills on a scale of one to ten would be a zero or or a one. It'd be <laughs> awful, dude. I tell you this: something about turkey hunting, and I know there's some guys out there who listen to this who are hardcore turkey guys, and they'll probably crucify me for what I'm about to say. But this is no joke, and I've told this story before. I was on a cornfield. I was driving or I was driving by a cornfield and there was a black uh, garbage sack that was stuck on a corn stalk and in the wind and it was big and puffed up and it was plastic. And there was a strutting Tom strutting around it. I dropped, I dropped down, I went around the corner, dropped down in the ditch, popped up on the other side and started calling. And that Tom came in and I shot him. And it was because he was in a field strutting around a garbage bag and that's all you need that's how easy they are to hunt that's you know right i mean is there any real strategy to turkey hunting i mean the the guys that come here say they there is and they're excellent turkey hunters and they usually shoot they all shoot their birds but yeah um you know i've shot some but it's been in the fall when i'm in the tree stand for deer yeah. and they their eyesight is so crazy good when i'm in a tree stand and I'm and I just look at them like, hey, there's dinner. And I try and sit really still and then I'll shoot some with a bow. So yeah. I've got big turkeys, but it's more just for dinner. Yeah. And out of my tree stand. <laughs> Love it. All right. So you mentioned that you were at the Iowa Deer Classic this entire uh, this in the entire all three days and yep. you you gave a presentation that i i i know you sent it to me before you give it looked over it, it looked really really well unfortunately i had state wrestling uh with my daughter so i wasn't able to make it to the classic this year what was that presentation in, uh, about and then what was the response from the people who listened to that so i would just call it keep iowa great um 
growing the movement on hunters that care and really just getting hunters together because for decades in other states hunters have not had organizations to band together and grow as a movement and be represented as a movement um the states that have had it the organizations have been pretty minimal or ineffective so what we're trying to do is different organizations in iowa like iowa sportsman's club they're trying to get as organized and as funded as the special interests are so they they get very organized and they have been that's why all these other states have been ruined is because they've been so well organized and so well funded and they're like yeah we'll pay for a lobbyist and that's what all the special interest um strategy is so now we're funded um we we the people the hunters are funded uh and we're growing and we we're on equal footing now with these special interests and i would say we can probably roll over a lot of these special interests and stop them dead in their tracks. So we will. And the reception was absolutely unbelievable. And mm. I mean, I, I would say I've been involved in this topic for 20 plus years. I mean, I used to fight the, the Michigan DNR on things and try and get got, you know, sign petitions and I'd write letters and have little debates with them when I was a young punk. Um, but it, it really, it didn't do anything and and even then i was like the chances are so slim but now the tides have turned and just the amount the response and and the people that are like that show up um it's incredible it's incredible the movement that has just started because people are like wow there is a path there's actually a way yeah. to do this and we mm -hmm. have a voice and the people are responding like please i i'm sick of seeing things ruined Let's make it great. And yeah. the reception is unbelievable. Yeah, that's a, that's awesome. And I think that's an, an example of what can happen if you organize and band together, right? Absolutely. And, and what, de depending on whatever topic it is. Um, now, the, the thing that I was interested about is some of these rules and regulations that you know, let, let, let's say like the crossbow uh, companies, right? They have lobbyists, yep. uh, Raven, Raven crossbows or the company that owns them has lobbyists in Iowa or working yep. in Iowa to try to get crossbows passed. Now, when you brought this up in your meetings or in these, in these presentations about, um, you know, outside interests trying to push legislation on the state of Iowa surrounding, uh, you know, the natural resources and rules and regulations what kind of feedback did you get from that it just opened people's eyes they were like i i had no idea that that's how it went through and a lot yeah. of people in other states are like you know like my buddies in minnesota were like hey i just woke up one day and crossbows got passed how did that happen they don't even know nobody yeah. understands the process and it's like that was an easy one for raven they just got a couple guys uh, to advocate for them, they got a couple politicians in their pocket. They snuck it in a bill. They avoided all the public debate on it fundamentally. Um, but people are like, now they're realizing like, yeah, I have woke up a lot of times and seen new laws that I'm like, how did that come about? And now people, are, it's just being exposed. And that was our goal, just talk about it. This is yeah. how things get bad. Well, the same way they got bad is gonna be the same way they get better, which, you know, the way they got bad is a special interest group targeted these states to make money and they use money and organization to ruin these states so they mm -hmm. could get what they want well we're using money and people and organizing to do good things though so yeah. you know money can do good things and bad things and, and i would say money is fundamentally the one thing that has caused all these states to be ruined money you can trace it down to that in almost every single state um, but money can also be the thing that fixes it too. And it, 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 there was a point where I'm like, you know, writing in is great and it is, it's, it's huge, but there's only so much that can be done. There's limits to that. Cause mm -hmm. if a politician saying, okay, I got these guys writing in, that's great. But I also got all this other side throwing me money in different forms or, you know, lobbying like crazy and donating to me. That's really hard to, to fight against. Yeah. So we we can fight back with money now 
And it's not a huge amount of money either. It's not massive amounts. Any of these states, it's in the tens of thousands of dollars. And yeah. it's like with with what um with what hunters spend on things, like a little piece of ground or I mean the the economies that revolve around hunting, the amount to make the quality better across the whole state, which would lift the economics up, the dollars up for the whole state, the opportunities for everybody, it's a drop in the bucket. You know, to do the right thing costs very little. Yeah. Yeah. And so there was a number. I, I can't remember if it was on the presentation or if it was something that you sent me personally, but 11 and 0 as far yeah. as uh, explain what I'm talking about. 11 and 0. Yep. So last year uh, they had nine bad bills that came out. Um, rifles for turkeys, crossbows for this. Cro there are a couple crossbow bills. Um, more tags for these special interests, outfitter stuff. It last year was just filled with all sorts of crazy stuff. And and I met with the legislators that, I mean, a large group of them. I met with a group at one point, and they're like, "Listen, these five out of the nine last year, there's no chance you're going to stop these." And even even some people on our side, even talking with folks in the DNR or whoever, I mean, that were not in favor of these things they have to be neutral but they're like i think these are going to pass well we got the hunters organized and i say we everybody mm -hmm. you know the hunters woke up which did not happen before that the politicians didn't hear from them they woke up and rode in and went to the capitol i got to debate all these issues all these bad bills i went for every one of them um and i i would get invited to debate these things and like i got to debate the Raven folks or whatever. Um, and we defeated all of them last year. So it was nine to zero and the five that they're like, this will get through. You're not going to defeat it. We defeated all five of those. That's awesome. So, so the hunters that are like, well, things can't change. You know, they're going to get their way. I don't believe that. And we proved yeah. them wrong. And I, yeah. I get so sick of that mindset, that defeatist mindset. Yeah. Um, it, it does no good. And if you get your butt going, and fight fire with fire and here's the thing now that we have money on our side and we have organization on our side and we're just on equal footing right mm -hmm. now you just weigh it out you say okay we're on equal footing but one group us has the truth and we yeah. just care about the resource the other yeah. guys all they care about is money they just yeah. want me 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 and they don't even live here they don't even vote here so who yeah. wins when you have the truth on equal footing you're mm -hmm. going to destroy him every time. Yeah. So that's why any biological argument across the Midwest, if people have it on making the hunting better and improving the age class, improving, just lifting up the whole system that's degraded, people can fix that stuff. Absolutely can fix it. And 15, yeah. 20 years ago, I wouldn't have said that, but absolutely. I've never felt a revolution like this. And I've, I've been obsessed with this stuff for 30 years and I've never felt a moment like the last few years, the hunters have woken up. Yeah. And that has a lot to do with um, the Iowa bow hunters association. And what is that? The Iowa sportsman club that yep. you were talking, talking for. Um, both of them are fantastic. Everybody listening to this should be a member of both of those. And, yeah. you know, let's just be honest about it. I mean, they need funds. They, they pay now a full-time lobbyist to go there and speak up for hunters. So the guys that are like, well, I don't know how to make a difference. Okay, write them a check. If it's 10 bucks, fine. If it's a hundred bucks, fine. If you can afford a thousand bucks, it's going right to Iowa causes to, to improve things for Iowa and both improve it and defend us. And I would say two years ago, it was just defense. It was just defense. Now we're on offense and we have most of the legislators that have a say in things where I would have said a couple years ago, yeah, these guys are scumbag sellouts. They're corrupt. They want to work with us. They actually, my, that is one thing that where my perspective has changed when these guys understand the facts and, and here's what I was very impressed with dealing with the legislators. They were more humble than I expected. Like, Hey, I don't hunt. I don't hear from hunters. I just hear from angry farmers and I hear from the special interest. Thank you for explaining this. And you go there with the information and the data and like even the harvest data, like, listen, we're down, we're half of what we were in 2005. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need to just kill every deer. 
when you explain this to them and just show them simple facts, they're like, I'm not, I'm not a hunter and I appreciate you hearing or uh, appreciate hearing about this. You can change their mind. I mean, they're very yeah. open to it. And the amount of meetings we've had with the different legislators and we've got a lot more scheduled uh, is astounding. And we're making huge differences based on facts and just based on the truth. And it's, it's refreshing to them. I mean, they, their words, that they yeah. get to hear from the hunters who care as opposed to just the special interests that just want to exploit our state. Yeah. Yeah, man, that that's, uh, it's so awesome to hear, to hear the results and see all the hard work start to pay off. The, the, the thing that I cannot say enough is if you're unhappy with how your state is being run and the natural resources, uh, that, the, the Department of Natural Resources manage um, the laws and rules and regulations that you, you guys have in your state, you can change it. You can definitely course correct your state if you get enough people to, to band together. Missouri, Ohio, little tweaks in Kansas. I think those three states are going to make some changes. I don't think none, none of this stuff's overnight. But yeah. There were, you know, any state that's been ruined didn't get ruined overnight either. Exactly. Um, it just takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of work. You know, the people who just want the easy button overnight. No, that's not how it works. But yeah, like very doable goals, though, like let's fix these common sense things that have data behind it. Like mm -hmm. like a, like a state saying, hey, let's Iowa knows what they're doing with regulations. Let's copy some of their regulations. And some yeah. of these states that are like, nope, we got to have rifles out uh, early to mid November. It's, it's madness. You guys yeah. can change that. You yeah. now you need to work with education. You need to talk amongst the hunters, and, and you'll never yeah. have a consensus. You'll have yeah. groups that are like, nope, it's always sucked here. It's always been in the middle of the rut. Rifles or guns. It's always been. Uh, total disaster. So it needs to stay that way. Well, you're gonna you're gonna argue with those guys, <laughs> and there's no logic behind it. But yeah, uh, it, it can be fixed. And let's start talking about it. Actually, there's yeah. data that says if we do shift it, this magic date on the calendar, uh, it would be better for everybody, not the yeah. guy with just five thousand acres that locks it up. It'd be better for everybody. More opportunities for everybody. The everyday yeah. hunter would have more opportunities. So wake up, people, and people are waking up. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know things can change. I know it. Yeah. Yeah. Before you, before we go any further into this topic and you start to just get fired up and, and, uh, and start to rage, we're going to change the topic now because I brought you in because I wanted to talk about your farms or the farm that you, that you have. And we drove around it and I was very impressed with what I saw. Um, I think I was more like one thing that really stood out to me and one thing that I wanted to, I might have to, I might have to lean on you a little bit uh, for is the ponds that you have. They all look so fishable and I want to go fishing on one of your ponds sometime. So I might have to lean on you a little bit and see if I can make that happen. That's for uh, the ponds are for other people. Again, I don't really <laughs> have time for fishing. I used to be a hardcore fisherman. I mean, I loved it. But yeah. I, I, I just love being outdoors, period. Yeah. That's how I got into hunting. Like, yeah. I was a kid in the city. I'd take my bike with a net, and I'd just drive out of town, and we'd go, like, catch turtles and frogs. And then I'd bring them back to my house, and we'd turn our bathtub into, like, lily pads. And my mom would freak <laughs> out because the house was full of turtles and frogs and snakes. And those little kiddie pools, we'd put those in the backyard. I want to turn my, my house into a zoo. So I've always yeah. been the nature boy. And, you know, I'll put ponds on my farm so other people can fish. I used to do it a lot. I just run out of time. Now, right. I want the kids to be able to fish, though. And I want friends to be able to fish because the more we can do things in nature, I just think it's be it's great for the kids. I mean, yeah. as opposed to figure, you know, not <laughs> name anything else out that the kids yeah. are getting into with yeah. electronics and video games just sitting there and all day. I mean, I love seeing the kids get off of that junk uh, yeah. and get into this. And and I got into deer hunting, not because somebody's like, hey, I'm going to take you deer hunting. I got into it because I just like being outdoors. You know, yeah. nobody, nobody where I grew up even 
my friends or family deer hunted. You know, it's just, I like being outdoors. And then somebody's like, Hey, let's go squirrel hunting. I'm like, okay, I'll squirrel hunt. And next thing you know, I saw a deer what when I was squirrel hunting. And then somebody's like, you could actually go hunt for those deer. And I just picked it up on my own. So it's just the love of being outdoors. And I would say, you know, I sit here and talk about regulations and all this stuff, but my passion by far, my favorite thing, period, is habitat, conservation, environment. I'm an environmental nut. I'm st- I'm a right winger conservative, but conservative and conservation go together. Mm-hmm. Leaving leaving the, the farms a better place than I found them, doing everything I can to make these farms top tier. Um, that's what I love. And, you know, I luck I, I was blessed beyond belief to fire myself for my job uh 10 or 15 years ago so i can just do this every day yeah i didn't think it was possible but that's that's what i do every day is make farms better yeah all right i want to i want to kind of hit rewind and i want to i want to give a throw out kind of a hypothetical scenario here you still own all the ground that you own yep. but it has never been managed in any way shape or form form basically it's just a place where deer live and maybe the farming right the the tillable ground uh gets farmed is there an order through all your experimentation through all the habitat work that you've done throughout the years and the knowledge that you've gained is there an order or a process in which the habitat work that you do on your farms has the greatest impact i would say yes and you know there's so many different approaches to habitat uh to transform in a farm there's a million different opinions and i'll say one thing and i might leave out a lot of context too like you know it depends if somebody lives close by it how how much time do they have but i mean any farm i go on uh if i'm able i mean and i am because i own them but you know, timber stand improvement of some form, and that's a huge can of worms um, on what that all is. But I will go in and do timber work. And for real simplistic sake, making your timber thicker, opening up the canopy by removing poor quality trees um, like elm, bitternut hickory, ironwood, um, a little bit of shagbark hickory that's grown too thick. Uh, just picking some junkier species and kind of trashing a little bit, a little bit of hinge cutting, a little bit of opening the canopy up, stuff like that is number one on my list, along with food being number two. And I don't necessarily myself, I don't plant food plots for me to be like, okay, I'm going to shoot a buck on this food plot. I do it for health and for keeping deer safe and for keeping deer in my farm and also feeding them 365 days a year. Um, and I just do a variety of diverse food plots. And I understand that most people can't do that. So it's just like, okay, whatever you have to work with, maybe it's a permission farm. If you can be like, make it really easy on the farmer and say, hey, would you leave a little bit of standing crops and I'll pay you well to leave those? Because if you try and nickel and dime them, why? Well, I, I think there's this many bushels and I you don't have to combine it. So you should pay, I should pay less. No pay him well because he doesn't want to deal with this stuff and so food would be key food and timber stand improvement hands down are the first things i do um to start out my farm and that just keeps deer uh centralized in my farm it keeps them safe and when i get a new farm a lot of times it doesn't have a lot of times it doesn't even have a buck i want to shoot uh the, the farm i have now sucked when i bought it i mean it was awful um, and I had some buddies that leased it long ago for three or four years. I'm like, yeah, we dropped the farm, the uh, lease on your farm just because it was junk. And it was, but it took a lot of work and this farm's great. But I could do this again and again and again um, to different farms. And I do. So, you know, food, food and, um, and timber work are key. Uh, and then the first year, I just, I don't go piss pound on my farm because I want it. I want it to get better and I want the deer to start feeling safe and I want to, I don't want to run them off. You know, if there's two and three year olds or whatever, um, I want them to learn that my farm's safe and I don't want them to get shot by, by the neighbors. And and some of that you're never going to control at all, but the more deer I can keep safe, the better. Yeah. Uh, and get them to the older age class. 
Yeah. And so is there a strategy, you know, cause, cause when it comes to habitat for deer, right? Safety, food, water, and you know, we all hunt bucks. So a doe population, right? And yep. so is there a specific thing that you have done on your farm that has generated the largest impact spe like specifically if if food plots trump uh hinge cutting or hinge cutting trumps uh i don't know like planting crp or something like that so hands down i'll go out of the box like okay. not even close and the number one thing is trigger management period and it's like yep. wait that's not what he was asking it is though all yep. these guys that are like I did all these things, but that buck, I couldn't contain myself. I had to shoot him. He was too young. It's not what I wanted to shoot, but I couldn't hold back. Yeah. Trigger management, mm -hmm. <laughs> letting these deer to get to an older age class and deer that are tempting, that whatever your goals are, if your goals were, I want to shoot three-year-olds and it's not what my, mine are, but if that's what they are, whatever they are, and there's yeah. a good two-year-old, you got to be able to let them go. Yeah. And that's one that sounds so obvious, so obvious, like, come on, but, it, but it's, it's huge. That's why most farms in the country are ruined is because people don't have trigger management. Well, if mm -hmm. I don't shoot them, the neighbor's going to shoot them. And I just, yeah. I, I couldn't, you know, whatever. I mean, I, if you want to do it, that's fine. I, I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just what I do. If I want, but I want older deer, I want a balanced age class. So I'm very, very disciplined. Um, and then, next just not over hunting my farm uh i just kind of stay around the edges and for the first couple of years and if there's nothing i want to hunt well i don't put all mags in one basket like people like well i want to hunt by skip farm if somebody were to say that well i hunt all over the place and i might get a deer um 10 miles from here it doesn't mean that the farm behind my house in any given year uh has a giant buck a lot sometimes it doesn't um so you know, you, you, I would say if, if you're making the habitat and the food exceptional, which are it's a whole can of worms, but diverse food, uh, exceptional cover, um, thermal cover, bedding cover, you name it, undisturbed, um, and, and hunting it correctly, you know, farms generally going to get considerably better than what you found it. I mean, I'll pull the cattle off there. Cattle and deer get along. No, they don't. Cattle ruin land. They ruin it. Destroy it. Mm -hmm. uh stuff like that like yeah you know my farm was okay and they're you know we let cattle in during this time you pull those cattle off and that's what i do and that farm will jump up for the quality of whitetails that that utilize it and the amount of whitetails that utilize it that's hilarious that you say that because when i was at your farm you were putting in a fence to hold cattle yeah so <laughs> there's a couple spots where i'm like uh there's nothing there there literally is nothing there and, and i have ag ground too where you're like yeah. hey how's your ag ground for hunting it's okay um but i have farms that are uh i have farms and i have parts of my farms that do nothing and it's like yeah yeah the chance that it could even be decent habitat just obscure exa examples of where um you know it just it take years and years and years and and i have a little bit of balance in me like 0.001 percent is going to put something towards cattle pasture and i mean it's just the worst of the worst and okay i can raise a few cattle for us to eat or this one um there's some families that are not well off and they're they're struggling and i said hey um you you guys can run cattle in there for free you know maybe help me with the fence maybe if i want a if I want some beef sometime at some point in the future, we'll work something out. But I kind of more did that for being helpful, uh, ruin soil too. So yeah. I'm going to rotationally graze them and yep. try and build up soil rotationally. Does that fit into deer hunting? No, no, it yeah. doesn't at all. But yeah. just the, I have enough, enough ground, um, where I can monkey around with that a little bit. So yeah, yeah a little you. contradictory. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so you mentioned you, there was a term that like selective, like being selective of where you are 
trying to improve this said habitat. Um, it, are there specific locations within a property or terrain feature that you focus on? I would say the most open areas like forested areas, you can do the big, you can have the biggest impact there. The, the deer usage will probably be fairly minimal. Um, and you know, there might be a, I mean, let's call it a 40 acre wide open piece of timber that, uh, one buck periodically beds in. And there might be a couple ideal spots for him to bed where he likes, you know, right on the crest of a ridge or something. Well, yeah. say there's two good bedding areas that he likes. Well, I'll open that place up enough and put enough trash on the ground and back cover, thermal cover, and new browse where all of a sudden it's like, okay, two or three bucks, mature bucks, frequent this area now. And it's loaded with deer beds and it's loaded with food and thermal cover. And, um, my ground will just house considerably more mature bucks yeah. so the carrying capacity for mature bucks and the carrying capacity for deer i can greatly enhance that everybody's like this is this is how many deer per square mile or how many bucks or whatever that a farm should have well one farm can be vastly different than another if you have exceptionally more brows uh you know if your brows is one to two hundred pounds per acre versus two to three thousand well, one farm's going to hold more deer and be able to feed more deer. Same with crops and food and food plots. Uh, and still to this day, my farm is way below carrying capacity. I would like to actually have the number come up. And I would say most of Iowa and our surrounding states are, I'd say the vast majority, with exception, are vastly below carrying capacity. And if you were close to carrying capacity, because I love whitetails, I love deer, and there's more to it than this, but I would rather improve the habitat, improve the food and, and the natural browse to give them optimal nutrition than just trying to knock back the population um, so they you know, did better on the very little browse that I had and the very little amount of food. I'd rather increase you know, the nutrition on the whole farm so it could sustain a larger population. And there is, there's definitely problems where people don't do anything and the populations explode and they destroy the browse. But my farm has a good amount of deer and I still have a ama amazing oak regeneration. Um, the natural browse is ample, uh, but I put a lot of work in it. And there's a lot of knowledge that goes behind that. And, you know, a private forester or a forester of some type would be able to help there. Uh, but I would say, you know, one, one little side topic is I think a lot of the deer population on the in the Midwest, um, people have shot way too many does and it's gotten far too low. And specifically in Iowa, I think it's a big problem. I mean, we hear shoot all the does, shoot all the does and kill them all. And it's probably, you know, I understand that to some extent, I get it to some extent, but that pendulum has swung too far the other way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can remember, uh, early two thousands, late nineties. And I was, I, I bet you back then in Southern, when did you come to Southern Iowa? 2000. Okay, 2000. So right around that time frame, um, man, the numbers were high where I, where I was on. I mean, like I was seeing 25, probably does, just does, 25 more deer uh, in a sit. And this isn't the same five deer walking in a circle around my stand. I mean, I was seeing tons of deer. Something happened. Maybe it was a little disease. Maybe it was a, a little bit like really good shotgun seasons maybe or like tag I know quotas for, yeah tag quotas and things like that and then that dropped down drastically and now we're i think we're starting to come out of that that dip that's just my opinion i think we're, we're slowly coming out of it to where like you said the, the term carrying capacity is coming back up just a little bit yeah people people don't realize that if you dial in your habitat really well your most 99 percent of the farms i go on people i talk to farms i see are not even close to carrying capacity my own farm included it's not even close um and yeah i mean if you look at just the data you know 2005 we shot roughly a little over 200,000 deer in the state of iowa well we're about half that now you know so like a little bit more than half that but yeah half as many 
Yeah. People are like, yeah, it's harder to find a mature buck. Harder, not impossible, but harder. Yeah, you're yeah. shooting half as many deer. Yeah, yeah. What about, um, th this is kind of in regards to carrying capacity where, let's say you create the bedding for them, but you don't have the, the food source. And what I mean by food source, I mean the additional food source of like food plots or you leave ag standing and it's more of a natural type browse scenario. Does the care, does the, is the carrying capacity with food higher than, a, than opposed to without additional food? So natural browse is gonna be still your staple component of any deer's diet. It's gonna be at least 50% of their diet. I don't care if you have cornfields, bean fields, whatever, clovers, alfalfa, it's still going to be half. So, you know, and literally some quick stats are, you know, if you look at open forest, it's probably one to 200 pounds of natural browse. It's woody, woody browse that delete the buds and new trees that are popping up. And then a little bit of forbs and legumes in there. There's one to 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. So if you open that canopy up and you start letting sunlight in there and let all this new regeneration take place. I mean, you can bring it to two to 3000 pounds per, per acre. Well, that's an immense difference. So that's going to be able to sustain more deer. Now, yeah. if you're also adding things like grains and legumes, um, clovers, soybeans, stuff like that, um, it's clearly going to create a massive amount of sustenance for the deer. And what I would tell people is, you know, it's critically important to have that stuff like a grain in um, like December, January, February. I mean, look at January this year when we had that snowstorm. Well, had that not let up and it turned to basically summer now, say that it kept up for a month and a half or two months at that pace. The guys that are like, yeah, I had very little forest browse and I had no food plots or very little food plots. They would have ate through those food plots. Um, their forest browse would be gone. And those deer would have been in rough shape, stressed for sure, stressed big time. They, I mean, and, and folks probably listening to this will know this. Like if you didn't have ample food and ample browse, you probably saw significantly more bucks shed their antlers earlier. And that's a sign of stress. So, um, yeah, just having enough food. So you're like, Hey, in springtime, there's still some food left. Maybe it's a grain. Um, and then it's hard to quantify this. It's hard to understand this unless you're really in tune with it. But to look at your forest browse, I mean, forest browse could sustain them without food plots, period. I mean, if you had excellent forest browse, uh, you wouldn't need really food plots at all. It makes hunting a little more difficult. And it's not ideal because food plots do offer a lot of nutrition. But absolutely, forest browse is fantastic. It's just people don't understand what good looks like a lot of the times. Um, and they don't keep up with it and it's a lot of work. So, so it's food plots. So, yeah. Yeah. Is there a tree or a grass or some kind of, maybe a multi flower rose, like an invasive species type of, uh, product or uh, plant or, or vegetation that is, that is a, a killer or it goes against what you're trying to do. And that's why you remove them. Yeah, I would say bush honeysuckle um, would be the worst one just because it keeps everything else out. Uh, multiple rows, on the other hand, it does get a little bit out of hand, but if it gets out of hand, it's pretty easy to treat. And it usually never takes over a forest like bush honeysuckle does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if bush honeysuckle takes over your whole understory, you're going to have no, no natural browse for the most part. Multiflower rose, they'll actually eat multiflower rose as much as I don't like it. I just try and control multiflower rose. And if it gets real bad in pockets, you can do everything from treat it with herbicides to burning it to whatever, you know, mechanically taking it out. But it doesn't bug me as much. Um, bush honeysuckle will ruin your nutrition. It will ruin uh, the natural browse. And you know, the guys are like, well, it's such a, a thick, nasty mess in there that the big bucks love it. I get that. So the solution there would just be, you know, slowly start converting it. 
because I get it. It's good cover, but you can replace that with something f far better than bush honeysuckle. I mean, I was in a buddy's farm the other day that had um, hazelnut and dogwood throughout his kind of open woods. And it's just like that would blow away bush honeysuckle for cover and it's providing nutrition and it's not taking over like bush honeysuckle does so you know double-edged sword with everything remove all your bush honeysuckle and do nothing yeah um you know that's probably not good from from just a deer wanting to be their thick standpoint but it would it would be better for nutrition so it's just like how is there another way to do that yes there's always a million ways to solve any given problem eradicate the bush honeysuckle in stages and open things up and replace it with something better is a, the right answer there. Yeah. What's, uh, you know, from a strategy standpoint, let's say I did some habitat work on my farm and I know across the nation, there's different types of trees and plants that deer will eat, but is there a plant or a tree that deer eat that kind of goes unnoticed, but they, they like, and so if I was to identify it, I could possibly set up a tree stand by it. Couple, couple answers to that. Yes. Um, any, generally any kind of new regeneration, like oak regeneration, they'll eat. That's, that's a little trickier and, and it's pretty minimal in Iowa, the oak regen. Um, most regen of any type if somebody were to go buy a new clear cut uh hey this just got clear cut and that's clearly more up north like wisconsin minnesota michigan stuff like that they'll notice that and you know people say hey this got clear cut and now there's a million deer in there what are they eating well it really doesn't matter necessarily the trees that were clear cut if they're stump sprouting you know, it could be a, a maple, it could be whatever. They're going to eat the stump sprouts and it could be literally maple, elm, down the list, hickory. Um, so practically speaking, if a guy could come in and do timber stand improvement and have stump sprouts uh, throughout the forest, that's going to have max nutrition and max attraction for the deer just because that's uniquely so high level nutrition versus like a tree seedling it'll be okay. But when you have stump sprouts, they're taking their whole, their whole um, root structure. And instead of putting it into a whole tree, now they're put, put all that energy and nutrition in just the little sprouts. So they're packed. I mean, they're like protein contents of soybeans. So the deer mm -hmm. love that. They love it. Um, but like dogwoods, hazelnut, uh, some of the shrubs like that, they love browsing on that stuff. Um, and you'll watch them go through the woods and they'll they'll browse a little bit on multiflower rows they'll browse a little bit on you know different different woody vegetation and and i'll open stuff up where you know i've got viney peas and different forbs and legumes and 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 a lot of times in the summer you'll see them just eating like ragweed you're like what mm -hmm. the world yeah they'll pound ragweed pigweed water hemp all that stuff now in the fall a lot of that stuff's gone so but it's good to have some of that um, you know, I would say if I'm on like a permission farm though, I would probably more gear towards, you know, hunting season and then try and find the mass producing trees. Um, and in Iowa, we still have oaks that are going to put out acorns every single year, like a shingle oak. We'll put out yeah. acorns every year. A white oak might be every two or three, oftentimes three. And if it's a drought year, it could even abort there. But, um, your reds will be more frequent. Your shingle oaks should be yearly. Your burr oak is going to be a little more common. Your white will be almost like the most infrequent. But just figure out where the um, the mass's amount of mast is falling, uh, and that'd be a great spot to target. You know, I'd almost yeah. rather do that than the natural browse. Yeah, yeah. Um, you you mentioned I'm kind of going backwards here, but the carrying capacity. How how do you identify whether or not carrying capacity is poor adequate or there's there's too many uh, deer on the property um i look so what i do and what is practical are probably different things but i'll look at like if you if you stand up on your truck for example by a field as just get elevated a little bit and look down at your field line and if you see a layer about 
I don't know, chest high to head high, where you can see where it's like no vegetation on the trees when you look at the forest and you there's this line, you know that they browse everything below that line. It's like, whoa, there is a lot of browse lacking. Um, and I'm just good at going through my farm and saying, hey, there's lots of open space in the forest. There's lots of regeneration. And I still see buds now. And it's it kind of be like looking at your food plots now. Well, if I knew my food plots had not a grain of corn or soybeans or a brassic or whatever, if it was gone in November, that's a problem. I want them, you know, I clearly want it December, January, February. Well, I can kind of assess that in the forest too. You know, is, is there still food for them? Is there still buds around? Is there still different things they're browsing on? Um, in, in, in my farm, there is. So uh, I would look at it a lot like your food plots. And if your food plots are running out and they're gone in November, you got a problem. You know, it's either too many deer or not enough food. And I would say the vast majority of the time, it's not too many deer, you know, it's just, you need to make your, your food plots bigger. It's not enough. Um, and there's also things, you know, in, in a little bit higher density areas, you know, planting clovers that can withstand browsing and really, you know, put the nutrition to them, get, get the lime right, get, or the pH, you know, and the nutrients, right. Keep them mowed and lush or, or sprayed or whatever, fairly weed free. Um, and they can sustain a lot of deer because they con they're constantly growing back, of course. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of my clover plots, I'll kind of, or, or even alfalfa, you know, I'll put them to a size where it's like, I hardly really, I really don't need to mow them because I've got them to a size where the deer keep them mowed for me and I'll just mm -hmm. clean them up every now and again, but the deer kind of take care of them. And if I, you know, if I planted 10 times as many, I'd have to just mow it and I'm kind of wasting my time. But if I planted 10 times less, uh, the deer would just, they'd eat it to nothing. So you got to kind yeah. of find that balance. Yeah. Yeah. That farm that you helped me load that deer on this year, uh, that farm is 100% from the chest down. Like they have eaten every single leaf off the ground, off, you know, everything. And so, um, my goal is I'm hoping that I can talk with the landowner and that I can maybe do a little bit of something, a just, just something to give them a, a, maybe a little bit more browse. My, my main concern as someone who doesn't have the resources that you have, as far as the, like planning food plots or even the knowledge is to just get more deer to stay on that farm you know they're obviously going to go other places for food um but I, I really am hoping that i can talk the landowner into letting me do uh some some maybe some hinge cutting or something like See, that i was thinking the same thing because i was going to contact that landowner and try and buy that farm and then i can do all these things um so practically speaking i would say most guys listening to this with hey i don't have a lot of resources exactly how i started i didn't know a thing about all this stuff way back yeah. i mean i was horrible a chainsaw is a resource mm -hmm. you need, and then you need knowledge yep. behind it and the second thing when it comes to food plots a bag cedar with some clover yeah. it's not hard neither one of them are expensive clover really you don't need much knowledge you just need maybe permission hey could i intercede this part of the the pasture or yeah. Um, this little edge over here or something, you know, but yeah. if I loaded up one of those red bag cedars, loaded it with clover, like Alice White, Red, Al Syke, Ladino, maybe a couple others, Frosty Bersim, for, for example, and I emptied that bag cedar out on a couple areas, that's going to be a lot of food. That's it. That's it. Now, there's more to it. Like, well, could you fertilize it? Could you lime it? Sure. But at a basic level, a full red bag cedar with clovers would do a massive amount of difference on a farm, massive. And it would feed them all summer, all fall, and even into the winter, there'll be, you know, that stuff stays pretty green. So, yeah. you know, that's an easy one, you know, spreading rye. A lot of farmers won't mind that. Hey, could I spread some rye, you know? And a lot of them are doing it anyways, or want to do it anyways. And they, some of them don't even have time. Um, 
to help build the soil, I mean, it's really good for the soil to have cover crops. So if I told the farmer, hey, could I spread some cover crops and I'll, I'll take care of the bill, uh, a lot of them, if they have a little bit of education, uh, would probably be pretty receptive to that. So I would say starting out a chainsaw with some weed trees, weed, like stuff that's just of no value, it's taken over the forest, it's junk, like I, I can make that list. Come up with five trees in your area that are kind of junky, won't hurt a thing to cut them. Start cutting those, and if you want to hinge them a little bit, fine. If you want to flush cut them, fine, uh, whatever. And then just get some clovers or rye, and, and maybe try and work with the farmer on leaving a little bit of grain and make it worth his while. That's a great start for anybody. And again, you're you're probably ahead of 99% of the farms out there, which, you know, most of them do are doing nothing. So yeah. great start right there. Yeah. Is this a competition at all? And what I mean by that is, is habitat management a competition between you and your neighbors? No, I, I, I don't. A lot of people think of it as a competition. It's kind of like... Um, it's kind of like the states that allow baiting. It's like how big, how many bait piles can can I get in? And I talk to my buddies, not faulting them a bit, but they're like, "Dude, my bait ran out, and the deer went over to the neighbors and got shot. I got to make sure I keep my bait filled up. I didn't even like baiting, but I just bait because if I don't, the deer leave. Well, people do the food plots the same way. You know, I'm going to plant all these food plots, and I might have a a really junky farm, but it's next to a really great farm so i'm going to put a food plot out there to pull the deer off so i can shoot them i mean and i get it i'm not i'm not i'm not throwing stones at that i'm not trying to be controversial and there's two sides to that you know there's there's these lines where it gets distasteful like like really dude you know you're just you, know, you have a, a ground that's worthless it's never been hunted forever and then you want to plant food and just sit on this dude's fence because you knew he did hard work and you know i guess there's two sides to that too. And I don't care what people do, but here's the thing. My desire, which doesn't mean a thing, but my desire is I wish everybody made their ground better, whatever that mm -hmm. is, whatever it is for the forest, for uh, the soil, for, for food plots, for sustaining wildlife. And I plant a lot of food plots that aren't going to impact deer. You know, I mm -hmm. like seeing the quail, the turkeys, the pheasants benefit all. I mean, the whole ecosystem on my farm, benefits from all this stuff stuff i'm not gonna hunt you know i don't yeah. turkey hunt i i mean i and i go around and i i kill nest predators all year round because my farm was infested with raccoons well you spent a lot of time on that i do i spent a good bit of time on that to never turkey hunt and now my farm is full of pheasants and turkey and quail um so competitively speaking it's like no my neighbors down the road i help them with this stuff do this 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 how do i do my crp do plant this this and this here's the steps here's how you make it great here's how you manage your forest i mean within a 10 mile radius of my farm i've been on a dozen farms helping them do tsi could that suck deer off of my farm sure do i care no because the more people that do it it's going to be better for everybody yeah and yeah. I don't look at it as a competition. I'm sure many, many people mm -hmm. do. Yeah. I, I do have to ask this question, though. Has there ever been a buck that has maybe been living on your farm and your neighbor's farm, and you're like, God, I got to do something on my farm to pull them in just a little bit further, and then it then it actually worked? Yeah, probably. Um, there, I'm at a different stage like now if a deer lived on my neighbor's farm and i know he grew them uh and he was after them there's a little bit of me that's like now it's because i'm older and i was not yeah. like this when i was younger i'm like i want you to shoot them. you grew them you yeah. earned it but that and that's not a right or wrong that's just my philosophy now and yeah. how i look at it 10 years ago i'd be like how do i get them over here i want to yeah. get a crack but yeah. you know i i just want to make my ground as good as possible and if that deer gives me a shot, if, if I have a legitimate chance and I'm not just sitting on the fence looking into my neighbor's ground, I, I personally would feel guilty about that. I don't, I don't even hunt by my neighbor's borders. I just don't. Um, and I don't care if people do, whatever. I, I just don't because I like, I like being away from people. I think the neighbors usually screw it up anyway. 
Um, but on the flip side, if a neighbor does something and they pull a deer off of my farm and they shoot it, if it's a mature buck, I'm like, props, good for you. If it's a, a young buck, if they tell me they're going to shoot a young buck, hey, man, we're going to shoot everything that walks. I just say, okay, that's fine. I, they can do whatever they want. Now, mm -hmm. the only issue I have, and it's off topic here, but is if they tell me, hey, we're going to, we're on the program. We want to grow mature deer and we're going to pass whatever. We're going to pass great three-year-olds. And all of a sudden they shoot all the good three-year-olds. Well, then I have a problem because we, <laughs> that's not what we agreed on. That's not what you told me. Your words should yeah. be worth something. Um, yeah. And I, and I don't think that's way too off base, but you know, that you don't own the deer. I don't, I don't. And I, and if a neighbor shoots a giant buck that was on my farm, great. I will be the first one to shake their hands. The jealousy bug has left me years ago. I did have it. I did have it when I was younger. I'll totally admit it, but the jealousy bug now, no, I, I, I'm not jealous. I'm happy for him. And I think the thing that changed my mind, one was, yeah, I shot big deer and that helps. Mm -hmm. um, but I just knew when I was jealous of other people, it made me like almost not like hunting as much. It, it made like I was, it was a pressure to shoot a buck because mm -hmm. I got to get a big one. And, and I don't like that. I want to, I want to no. hunt because I love it. And it, I could feel that it made me have a little tint of like, you know, it di I just didn't enjoy it as much. So I, I just, I really worked on making sure I was happy for other people when they shot a giant. Now, yeah. if I had a uh, once in a lifetime buck on my farm and uh, I put everything I had and I saw that deer since he was two years old mm -hmm. and he, I was chasing him that year and the neighbor shot him, would I feel maybe a little bit out of the gate? Like, darn it. Wish I would have got a crack. Yeah. yeah. I, That's I, normal, I, man. Yeah. That's normal. But, but I wouldn't be uh resentful bitter jealous or anything like that but i oh shoot yeah but i feel you know. you. i've been there before when sam calora shot that uh buck that i called shipwreck there was a moment there that that i was like oh dang it dude like everybody's so, been there oh, was so close but then because sam is such a great guy i just congratulated him man i was like dude this is so awesome uh and uh and so it is, yeah, I, it burns a little bit sometimes, except, especially when you're invested uh, in, in an animal for multiple years, right? So um, I'm in a good area. Like, you know, the people around me generally care and they want, they're doing things for the long term. Mm -hmm. Now, if I had like an outfitter next to me, that's like, no, nah, dude, I'm taking in paid people and they're, they're just going to shoot a buck. They're not coming back. They don't care what they shoot. Yeah. And that's where I'd be like, I would want to remove myself from that situation because yeah. they, they're not, they're not invested in our area. They're not. And if I'm like, listen, dude, that was our best three-year-old that somebody, I don't care if it was me, anybody around here could have shot someday. Um, and you just got to get your buck because you paid for it. Uh, those are situations I'll just remove myself from. And long ago when I had neighbors like that, um, I mean, this is clearly one in a million talk, talking to very few here, but I would just like, I'll sell this farm if it yeah. became that much of a headache. So I, I would say it's somewhat important if somebody's like thinking about where they want to be long term. I think you'll generally be better off the more like minded people you're surrounded with. And you'll never see eye to eye ever yeah. with all the people, but it does make it easier because people around me care. And they're not just here like, what can I shoot? What can I take? Take, 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 take. They want to give. They want to yeah. give the environment to the farms. And it's not just about shooting a buck. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's great. Out of curiosity, and I'm only bringing this up because you kind of mentioned it a little bit before we started recording. And that is, you know, obviously the hunting media or the hunting industry always has their their take on what is right and wrong for a strategy for whether that's food plots or or hinge cutting or whatever is there a topic that a lot of people listen to that they shouldn't listen to or that goes against what you've seen or what you try to accomplish um 
I would say just because somebody's on YouTube does not make them an expert. I don't care if they've been on YouTube for 20 years. Uh, and a lot, some of these people are friends. I'm like, they've got it completely wrong on certain things, fill in the blank, whatever it is. Uh, if, if we want to try and make it objective, black and white on habitat, on how they do things. Um, don't, I mean, I think this, I'm preaching to the choir to the most people here, but just because somebody has a hunting show and just because they're on YouTube, do not think that they have it all figured out. And guess what? I don't have it fi all figured out. And when you meet people who are deer experts, which everybody is, every hunter, farmer, the guy at the seed store, they're all, everybody's a deer expert. Mm -hmm. um, but when you meet somebody who's a deer expert and they like, I have it all figured out, don't listen to that guy. Don't. But there's a lot of bad information out there and you got to be sharp at sifting through it. I mean, and there's certain things with people where I'm like, hey, that guy, in my opinion, in my opinion, he's got 80% of it right. Few yeah. things I would change, few things I disagree with, but he's got 80% right. And then there's guys where I'm like, dude, you got, you, you don't got, you don't even have 20% right. I mean, 80% yeah. of what you're talking about is, um, is crazy. And some of them have fairly large audiences, which, yeah. you know, I don't care about that part. I could care less, but just the information is just factually incorrect. Yeah. Um, you know, but I guess if, you know, a hunting celebrity or whatever is, is doing it purely for entertainment and they're not bringing information with, that's that's an easier one to deal with. But the ones that are giving advice and strategy, there's a lot of garbage out there, but there's a lot of great stuff, too. It's just it's sifting yeah. through anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any final thoughts uh, in regards to habitat? Maybe, you know, you you your farm is pretty big and you've collected that land over the course of several, several years. Um, 30. And 30. Right. It and so at 12 years old saving for land uh i'm 45 now so yeah i guess more yeah. 30 33 years it took me to do this yeah and so people whether they own one acre or uh they own the same amount as you what five acres that's what i yeah. have five you have five acres five acres yeah you do sure do skip uh, what are some tips or not, not necessarily tips, just some final thoughts on what they can do to improve the habitat, whether they love turkey, whether they love uh, pollinators, whether they love birds, whether they love deer. So start with something and it does not need to be significant. Like I said, if you went out there and you had permission on 10 acres and that and the landowner said, yeah, you could take care of some of these trees that are junky here. And you, you did that. Little things like that. I spread some seed over here. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, there's a lot of room with the governmental programs, which I love what they do. I guess the only part of the governmental programs I don't like is just that as a country, we're bankrupt uh, and they're throwing money out that they shouldn't be throwing out. But beyond that, they're great. So look at like Look at the conservation steward programs. Look at equip funds. Look at REAP funds. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, I'd lo love to do all these programs or I'd love to do these improvements. Oh, they're, they'll pay me to do them? Yeah. Yeah, they'll pay me to do them. So that's another way to get a landowner involved. Or even if you have permission, like, hey, could we look, could, if I talk to the NRCS office or whatever um, and I can get these okayed, I'll do them. You can have the money. It won't cost you a thing. And I'll do the work. You take the money, whatever. So I think there's a lot of creative ways at doing little little projects. So I would say anybody, even if you don't own land, if you are friends with a landowner, could call the NRCS office and say, hey, what kind of programs do you have where I could maybe make some, some conservation improvements, some habitat improvements, down the list. I mean, they'll pay you for native grasses. They'll pay you for doing strips of food plots in certain situations, timber work, massive amounts of money. Um, I mean, $13 billion just got injected into some of the equip programs, massive amounts of money um, because Biden wants to buy your vote. Uh, so, I mean, it's not going to work with me. I'll take some of the money, which is my own money. I'm just taking some back. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, so there's, there's financial incentives and then you're like, Hey, I'm battling trying to convince this landowner to do these little things. Well, when you add, Hey, you'll get paid to do it makes it, makes it pretty easy. And the other stuff, like I mentioned, the, the chainsaw, the bag with, um, clover or rye or something like that. We're talking like 20, 50, hundred dollar expenses on making some fairly substantial gains. So, um, there, there's a million things that people can get involved in. Uh, I think we do a pretty good job on Iowa Whitetail on, you know, laying out a lot of the programs, a lot of the improvements, uh, habitat stuff. Ask a question there because that's free. That's non-biased. Yeah. We're not trying to sell anything. That'd be a great place. Hey, I got this question on this farm. Throw it up there. You know, so a lot of ways people can go there. Yeah. Well, Skip, man, as always, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, chat about habitat, chat about deer hunting and, and uh, the passion that we both share for the outdoors. So, Skip, man, I'll let you get back to uh, farm work now. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for having me.